Thursday, PFTOT, and we are heading into Chris Sims' long weekend. This is it for you, so let's make it count as we get through five topics we didn't get to during today's PFT Live. And I want to start with Emmanuel Sanders. You know, there's been a lot of criticism of Antonio Brown, the guy, but no one has ever questioned his work ethic or his ability. And Emmanuel Sanders said this week on 104.3 in Denver that no one works like Antonio Brown. He is the hardest working practice player that Sanders has seen. John Gruden has said the same thing. For all his flaws, and, and there are more than a few, when it's time to show up and work, he puts in the work, and that's one of the reasons why he's one of the best, Chris. Yeah, it is. You know, and I think it's one of those things, too, where I think a lot of the great players in football are, are maybe much harder workers than, you know, sometimes get credit for. Uh, just because they're so great, we just go, we always talk about their play. And, you know, guys like Deion Sanders or Michael Jordan and the history of the sports and everything like that are famous for what they did off the field as well. But it doesn't necessarily become mainstream news sometimes. But, uh, I mean, it's all I've ever heard about and Antonio Brown, Mike. And I always, and you might have heard me say this before, but I always reference this story. Story when I talk about Antonio Brown, when I went to the Pittsburgh uh, Steelers training camp a few years back and, you know, walking out on the field, watching Antonio Brown before practice started doing cone drills, receiver drills, doing all these things. I mean, in a full lather, attacking these drills at 110 percent full speed, you know, in the middle of training camp and practice hasn't started yet. And then I saw after practice staying on the field. So this is one thing you constantly hear about him. And when you have talent and you work hard, that gives you great confidence and great self bravado. And I think that's why we see Antonio Brown the way he is because of all those things. It, it also gives you some, some leeway to maybe not show up for meetings on time. I mean, if you're going to show up early on the practice field and bust your butt even before the coach blows the whistle for the first time, you are a worker. And yes. look, the, the Steelers dealt with that a lot, and then they got to the point where they didn't want to deal with it anymore. And whether this was Ben Roethlisberger saying, get rid of him or I'm not going to hang around, or whether they just decided he's at the point where the skills are going to start to diminish, whatever the case may be, he is a very hard worker. Now, he may be a handful for quarterback Derek Carr to deal with if Derek Carr isn't delivering the football accurately or often enough, but he's going to put in the work, he's going to set the example, and that has a ripple effect on the rest of the team because they see how he's working, Chris, and they figure, I better do the same thing. Exactly, Mike, and that's where you get into the problem as a coach, and that's where it's hard to be a coach in the NFL sometimes because, yeah, you want to crack the whip the same for everybody. I hear that, but, man, this Antonio Brown's one of the best receivers in football. They couldn't deny that. They're seeing the work ethic every day, and you're right to the biggest point, what you said, what when a guy like Antonio Brown who's going to Pro Bowls and on the All-Pro team and the rest of the team goes damn he's out there before us every day he's out there after us every day it does become contagious through the rest of the team and now the coach goes well damn that little sucker okay gosh he was late for meetings today but look at the effect he had on the rest of the team throughout the rest of the day and that's how sometimes yeah you can get yourself cornered in the NFL as a head coach and, and stuck in a situation where you go damn and all of a sudden you got to get rid of him and we see all this drama but uh, yeah I think that's it's it's a, a very valuable conversation and, and certainly something that doesn't get talked about enough, maybe. Plenty of drama in Chicago related to the kicker position. Beyond that, everything seems to be in great shape. And receiver Taylor Gabler, Gabriel points out the quarterback Mitchell Trubisky drastic increase in his confidence heading into this year. That is good news for the Bears and bad news for anybody who has to play them because Trubisky has said it himself. He doesn't have to learn a new offense this year right? He's feeling better. He's feeling more confident. He's feeling like he knows what's going on. This is a new, ch a new situation for him where he has that continuity. And if he's more confident, he's going to play with more confidence and he's going to play even better, Chris. And Trubisky's a guy, you know, we, we're, we're kind of not sure which way the career is going to go. Yeah. There's a chance the arrow is going to go straight up in 2019. I feel like it's going to go straight up. Yeah. I mean, to all the points uh, you just mentioned, yeah, second year in the system, finally, you know, has talent around him for the second year in a row. You know, let's let's not forget the first year. OK, it was, a, you know, a new system, a rookie rookie quarterback. And Tariq Cohn was literally one of his two wide receiver starting wide receivers. They were depleted across the uh, across the 
the the the roster as far as you know weapons on the offensive side of the ball in 2017. 2018 was a great year. He played great football. They went 12 and four. I mean, they lost one of those games with Chase Daniel at quarterback. I mean, he did a number of great things and put them chance to win the game. But I'm sure he's feeling good. And I'm I'm uh, you know as we talked about Trubisky yesterday, I'm a believer in him and his abilities. And I uh, I would be shocked if he doesn't have a good year this year. One of the realities of free agency in the NFL, we see a lot of turnover every season uh, from from uh, a- pretty much every team. I remember back in the 70s, it was rare that you would have a team that wasn't fully constructed of guys who were drafted and signed as undrafted rookies by that team. Now, like I said, it doesn't happen much, but it's happening in Indianapolis. How about this? 21 of 22 starters are going to be back for the Colts in 2019. I almost think it's bad to have that many starters back. Like you need to to have an injection, a new voice, a new something, but you know, it's so rare that it occurs. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but 21 of 22 back for the Colts as they enter Frank Reich's second year as the head coach. Yeah, that's uh it is pretty rare this day and age in the NFL. And th- there's going to be some new voices, in, you know, in, in the locker room to the very least, you know, hey, Justin Houston's going to be there, right? He'll be able to add, you know, his two cents to the defensive side of the ball. You know, Devin Funch just coming from Carolina, uh, he'll be on the offensive by- side of the ball. But uh, it, 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 I think, speaks a lot to the way Chris Ballard has built his team. Yeah, he didn't ma- need to make a whole lot of drastic changes in free agency. He's done it the last few years with the draft and young guys in the draft, and he's trying to build the continuity that way. And, you know, when you do it that way, that's when you can build a dynasty. You know, as we saw, like, with the Seahawks, the, their first little, you know, whatever, one Super Bowl, two Super Bowls in a row but all the playoff runs they built it through the draft that way and developed that continuity and uh there is something to be said about that in football more than any other sport hey chris and just wait until chris ballard decides to start spending some of that cap right? space they're stockpiling Seriously. right at the right time for the right player they're going to swoop in and they're going to grab a superstar and they're going to add him to the mix they, they, they are they, they are one of those teams that yeah, they're of all the teams the Patriots something. should be worried about, that's a yeah. team that, you know what, they're starting to get it together. They're getting it figured out, and Andrew Luck still has plenty of years left. And uh, yeah, I think it ultimately is a very good thing to have that kind of continuity. I think the more continuity you have on your roster, on your coaching staff, throughout the organization, it's just less crap you have to deal with, less change you have to process from one season to the next. And it's minimal change for the and you don't have to tinker with your schematics Colts. too, right, Mike? I mean, you know what you got already. Oh, I don't – this guy, we know what he does well and doesn't do well. And you can improve your playbook from there instead of like, you know, what we're talking about. Okay, yeah, out of the 22 starters, we got uh, – half the team is new. You know, you almost have to go through an evaluation period as a coach and that during that to go, okay, wait, what can we expect of this guy? Can I call this defense when he's the nickel cornerback? Whatever it may be. So that's taken out of the equation to where you can just continue to build forward. Well, you know what else it allows you to do? It allows you to spend more time getting your backups ready to go when injury go. strikes exactly because you don't right. have to overdo it with the starters. They know what's expected of them. Let's get the next level of guys ready to go for when right. we call upon them to step in and step up. Yep. Right? The Oakland Raiders have called upon Richie Incognito to step in and step up on the offensive line. So far, so good for Incognito as a player. John Gruden said recently that Incognito is pretty good. I like him. He's a Pro Bowl left guard. The last time he strapped it on, he wasn't just good. He was one of the best. And there's never been an issue with Richie Incognito's playing ability. The question is, what happens when things go haywire? He will be fine, and he will be fine, and he will be fine, and he'll hit a point where all of a sudden he isn't fine. And we've reported, and Uh, There's been some uh, other reports uh, regarding the steps they took in Buffalo to beef up security when they felt it falling apart with Richie Incognito. I mean, when he goes off the deep end, it is a deep end that he finds, and it scares a lot of people. So everything's great for now. But the thing you have to factor in if you're the Raiders is the possibility that out of the blue, during the season, during the playoffs, all of a sudden there's going to be an issue with Richie Incognito that's going to screw everything up. And they, they surely understand that going in. But that's something that you just have to watch and wait for if you are uh, a member of the Raiders organization or a Raiders fan, Chris. Yeah, that's the scary thing about Richie Incognito. Uh, No question about it. Uh, The play, yeah, I never worried about the play. The attitude when things are going well, and as far as just the attitude towards playing football – 
I mean, it's amazing from anybody I've ever talked to. I mean, that's what I think John Gruden and Mike Mayock brought him in there because not only is he a good player, but he's no nonsense. You know, I think he calls out other offensive linemen. They're scared of him. You don't know what he's going to do. He might fight you. And so he adds an attitude to the offensive line. And they got some young guys there that they're they're trying to uh, bring along as far as draft picks and everything else. So, uh, I, you know, uh, it's a culture change, an attitude change. But you're right. The scary thing is, is when things go bad, what will happen? I, I do look at that team and go, I don't know. There's some, there's enough renegadeness about the team to where I think he might be in a culture and environment that really fits him, and that, that there may not ever be a problem because it's just going to be the way they are a little bit. There's going to be maybe a few scuffles in the locker room through the year, and a few, you know, f you in the locker room, and do offense you play better, defense you play better, whatever. That might be kind of the the dynamic the Raiders have, anyways. Well, you know, he's got a reputation for being a bully, and the best way you deal with a bully is you confront him, and maybe someone in that locker room will be able to confront him and and shut him down if he is ever inclined to go that way. Look, I don't know what's going to happen with Richie Incognito, but this guy has been out of football for two full seasons, two separate times, right? Uh, Once after he left Miami and once after he left Buffalo, and... That, that's not an accident. There's a reason for that. And, and it, it all mo- may go extremely well this year. It may go well into next year. But there's just a belief based on history at some point something's going to go haywire with Richie Incognito. And, you know, the Raiders are willing to take that risk because financially they haven't made a big investment. The Dallas Cowboys have yet to make a big financial investment in running back Ezekiel Elliott. We feel like that is coming. Another thing that we may need to pay attention to that could be coming, some sort of league action. We've talked about this a few times, arising from the video of Ezekiel Elliott confronting a 19-year-old security guard at a music festival in Las Vegas, pushed up against him. The guy fell down. The guy claims he was shoved. The video is inconclusive as to whether or not there was a shove. But either way, it was an aggressive posture by Ezekiel Elliott that caused the guy to back up and eventually fall. The Dallas Morning News reported on Wednesday that the NFL immediately sought information from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department as soon as the video surfaced. So, look, you know, people say, oh, it's no big deal. The Cowboys, oh, we're not worried. Oh, it's nothing. Oh, he didn't do anything. Because Elliott's already been suspended for violating the personal conduct policy, he's inherently on thin ice. Remember, we made a lot about the letter that was sent to Elliott back in 2017. Further uh, behavior of this nature could result in banishment from the league. So they are watching, they are reviewing, they are studying. And if they come to the conclusion that there was even a slight violation of the personal conduct policy, Chris, his history is going to set him up for more punishment and people are going to be surprised if it happens but I'm here to say do not rule it out because the league is clearly on the case and we'll see what they decide but if they decide there was a violation we we, we may not be very happy with the end result well Ezekiel is uh, you know like you're saying he's on their radar so yeah I mean I, again I, I said this last week or two weeks ago when they brought it up I don't think this is a suspendable offense I mean yes it's not the greatest look I could see them maybe fining him if they want to take away a game check maybe something like that okay with the way the NFL operates and things I, I could see them doing that but I really would be shocked if it ended up in losing a losing him for a game or two just because uh you know, he aggressively stepped into a 19-year-old. And again, I'm not condoning what Ezekiel Elliott did and all that too. But, you know, I guess, Mike, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I'm just throwing this off off of you. I mean, have we heard anything from the league about are they looking up Richie Incognito and the things he did in the offseason and the issues he's had? I just feel oh, like he'll be he, – no, 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 Incognito. Okay. I think Incognito will be suspended. He's got two guilty pleas from two separate incidents right. that happened last August. So he, he will, I, I think, before the start of the regular season, he will be suspended for one or more games. So, yes, that that's uh, – that one, that one isn't as close of a question. I think the issue with Elliot is we see the video and we think, well, like you say, well, that's really not a suspendable offense. But when you factor in his history, yeah. it becomes a suspendable offense. The problem is there are still plenty of people who look at what was done in 2017 and think that wasn't a suspendable yes, offense. Yes, right, but, right. But it doesn't matter. It's on his record, right? Yes, it's like right. the black mark on your record. I'm sure you have a few of those from an academic standpoint from your time in, in school. But No doubt. But, I digress. But uh, but that's – so it's already there. It's not going away. So the fact that it's there makes this incident 
more problematic from the league's perspective. That's why I added it to today's list of topics for PFTOT, yeah. because people need to be ready for what could happen. We know what to expect from Richie Incognito. We know that Tyree Kill at some point is likely going to find himself suspended. With Ezekiel Elliott, if it happens, there's going to be some Cowboys fans who are pissed. There are going to be fantasy football owners who are pissed. There's going to be others who are just flat out confused because they see that video and they react the way you did. I don't see anything there you would suspend a guy for. Right. And, and, and you know, I, I hope that the NFL can take into account that I think their last suspension, I'll be one of those guys that would say that, I think was a little too harsh for Ezekiel Elliott. I think there was some, you know, holes in what the NFL did as far as obtaining some information without getting into all the details and everything like that. I'm not, so, not going to sit here and say that I definitely thought that warranted a six-game suspension that year. So maybe they can take that into account. I don't know. To me, it just sometimes, Mike, I look at it, I see like the NFL pursues – some people's things more aggressively than others, and I don't understand that at times. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not wrong. I didn't know we were about to talk about this, so I'm kind of going off the top of my head here. But yeah, I just I don't know. It seems like some players they aggressively go, oh, we want to get the information, and then other ones it's just like, oh, we're going to kind of wait back and see before we actually try to get the information on that one. I think for some players, and I'm not talking specifically about Elliot here, for some players, they develop a belief as to who he is and what he is and what they conclude may be different from what the public image is. So in their mind, it's justified to be aggressive because for everything they get him for, there's five other things he's getting away with. And again, I'm not saying that that's Elliot, but it could be they have flagged him that way, okay, that this is yeah. a guy who, you know, maybe he parties too much. Maybe he's involved in too many things that are close to the line. Maybe he doesn't really comport himself the way we would like, and this is our way to try to engineer his behavior. When he does cross the line, we're going to get him, so maybe he will stay away from the line altogether instead of dancing on it. Again, I don't know that that's how they feel about Elliot, and if they do, I don't believe it's justified. My point is yeah, that's a good I think theory, a lot though. of – I, yeah. I think there's a lot of justification for how aggressively – and look, prosecutors do the same thing. They're going to be more inclined to go after somebody for a relatively meaningless offense if they believe this is a bad person who gets away with a lot of stuff. Again, I'm not saying that that's Elliot, but that would explain the motivation. Yeah. That for whatever reason, they believe that Elliot did the things that he was suspended for, even if he didn't get a fair chance to prove that he didn't. And maybe they're still frustrated with Elliot for fighting it as hard as he did because it made them look like a Keystone Cop organization presided over by a kangaroo court. So they may have some lingering animosity about that as well. Yeah, that, that, you're, you're, that, that was a lot of good stuff there. That's why you're a lawyer. That's why you're Mike Florio. I, I agree. Not anymore. I'm well, not yeah. a lawyer anymore, baby. Well, ten way. years. As of, you know, the anniversary is coming up. July 1 will be 10 years since uh, we officially joined NBC. 10 wow. years. That's awesome, man. That's that's cool to hear. I mean, yeah, you've done a good job, man. I think you made the right career choice. I bet you weren't a very good lawyer. You're pretty good at pro football talk. Asshole. <laughs> Oops. All right. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. I, I, you know, I was okay. I didn't. Here's the thing, though. It is a tough, stressful life. And most of the people who are involved in any type of a litigation practice cannot wait to find a path out of it because it is a tough way to make a living. I mean, you're doing, you're helping people, et cetera, but you're carrying that burden around all the time. Ooh. If I say the wrong thing at the wrong time, I'm going to screw up somebody else's interest. I can always move on to the next case, but if I don't play this just right, I'm not going to get this person their one shot at justice. And it's, right. a, it's a hell of a burden to carry. I carried it for 18 years, and I'm very happy to say I'm 10 years removed from having to worry about it. But uh, you got to deal with me, Sims, and so do the rest of you. Tomorrow, though, it'll be just me. I think Big Cat on PFT Live. I'll do PFT OT. Sims, take the weekend off. We'll see no you on No problem. Monday. Sold. See you Monday. Later. See ya. Hi. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.